My name is Anne Hunter Pirtle, and I've been following politics for 20 years. I was 14 when the Bush v. Gore election captured the nation's attention in 2000, and like only an eighth grader could, I announced to my parents and classmates that I could do better than either candidate, and that someday I would. <laughs> I studied political science at the University of Nebraska in my hometown, and then I worked on environmental policy at the White House from 2011 to 2013 and served as a speechwriter to a cabinet member from 2014 to 2016. In the summer of 2012, when I was working at the White House, there was a severe drought in the Midwest and South. My boss was in charge of the U.S. government's drought task force, and I walked into my first task force meeting to a very long table with about 30 real serious sub-cabinet officials sitting around it. And I felt tense because I was maybe the most junior person in the room and because I didn't really know what anyone could do about a drought. I just knew that even the federal government couldn't make it rain. <laughs> but I came away from those meetings with a glimpse into the thousands of actions that government could take to help people through a crisis. Weight restrictions could be relaxed on federal highways so that trucks could haul more feed to keep herds alive. More federal lands could be open for grazing. River dams and locks could be opened to get more water to where it was most needed. At the White House, we called those actions policy. But for some farmers and ranchers in 2012, they meant the difference between staying on their family farms and going bankrupt. My friends and I reflect that during those years, we gained something close to a superpower, an unshakable knowledge that our voices mattered, that we had ideas worth listening to, and that we could change the world. Because every day for five years, we saw the evidence of it. We witnessed our voices shape major decisions and even influence national events. Fast forward to 2020. It's an election year unlike any other, and we've been hearing an awful lot about voting lately. There are a growing number of barriers to voting in the United States. Dark money in politics, gerrymandering, and burgeoning voter suppression efforts. And we're living through a pandemic and the worst recession of our lifetimes. Millions of Americans are feeling like their voices don't matter. When that's the case, it makes people less likely to vote. And I fear that telling people incessantly to vote without addressing these underlying challenges will backfire. We could easily have a TED talk on each of these barriers, but today I wanna to zero in on the one piece of this puzzle that is in our individual control, and that is cultivating an unwavering belief in the value of our own voices. It sounds simple, maybe even trite, but it's absolutely essential to protecting our democracy. I need to acknowledge here the tremendous privilege I had to be validated this way in my early 20s. It's a type of affirmation most people never experience. I have white privilege, middle class privilege that allowed me to start at the White House by doing a three month unpaid internship and a supportive family. I also applied to the White House internship program three times before I got accepted. So please know, this isn't me saying if I can do this, anyone can. There are barriers in front of millions of Americans who are equally deserving that make it difficult to access the experiences I had. I also gotta say that in the Black Lives Matter protests this summer, we've seen a new generation of activists step into their power and it's been awe-inspiring. As activist and writer Adrienne Marie Brown says, things are not getting worse, they're getting uncovered. We need to hold each other tight and continue to pull back the veil. Nobody needs validation from me, some white lady, to take up space and make change. That said, I do know something about cultivating confidence in your own ideas. So if you are someone who doesn't feel confident talking politics, who doesn't feel at home at a protest, or contacting your elected officials, or maybe even voting, I'd like to offer a secret to always knowing your voice matters and I'm here to share it in a way that anyone can use. It starts with asking yourself a few simple questions and repeating the exercise on a regular basis until you know the answers in your bones. What do you know? Not just what's your area of expertise, 
but you're the expert on your own life. What's it like to be a single parent, to have overcome abuse or addiction, or to be a caregiver for your aging parents? Whatever your lived experience is, that's your expertise. What matters to you? What values do you live by every day? For many people, it's things like hard work, family, responsibility, honesty. Or you can ask yourself, what would make your life a little easier right now? What if childcare was more affordable? Or you didn't have debt from medical bills? Or you didn't fear police brutality in your community? What are you curious about? Maybe you're not an expert on how to save the environment, but you know you care about the issue and you're willing to do a little research using reputable sources to find out what steps you can personally take. How do you express yourself best? Maybe public speaking makes you nauseous, but you're a good writer. Maybe you have an interest or a background in theater or dance. When you're grounded in what you know, your own life, your values, your interests, and use them to guide your research, you can know you're speaking from a place of experience. Today, I run a nonprofit here in Lincoln called Stand for Schools that works to advance public education in Nebraska. We sometimes ask our supporters to contact their elected officials, and that contact from constituents is essential. But we, and most other policy and political professionals, need to work on creating ways for people to engage beyond just calling their senator. Because voting is important, but people are more than just voters. If I ask someone who's shy to contact their congressperson, they may really struggle. But if they're a talented photographer and I contract with them to take photos for the organization, then they're serving as an expert. They're sharing their talents in support of a cause they believe in. And that's the point. We all need to feel like experts sometimes. When we do, that's when we're most able to feel confident and give back. By being in conversation with yourself on a regular basis and finding ways to engage with causes you care about that are within your skill set, you can start to find your voice. Not all opinions are equally valid or supported by facts, but all people have inherent value. Make this self-dialogue a daily practice and you can cultivate the confidence of knowing your worth. The world doesn't always give us the validation we want, need, or deserve. But as psychiatrist, author, and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl wrote, when we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. We can give ourselves the validation the world declines to give us. These practices may be simple, but the stakes could not be higher. If we fail to address people's confidence in their worth, government's ability to represent them and their interests, and address the systemic issues that prevent people from voting, more and more folks will shut down before using their voices, and democracy will cease to exist. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you, my biggest worry about doing this talk is that some people may think I'm saying they don't have to bother with voting. Quite the opposite. Voting is more essential now than it's ever been. What I am saying is that when politicians and pundits keep telling struggling people to vote without addressing their needs, it contributes to a perception that voting doesn't matter, but it does. When we fail to find our own voices, others speak for us. And that's when we begin staring down the kind of unimaginable yet avoidable hardship that's already happening in this country with the COVID-19 pandemic and recession. What I know for sure from working on two federal disaster responses in five years is this. Hundreds of thousands of Americans dead is a choice our leaders are making. We still don't have a coherent federal response, or in Nebraska, a state one. So we as individuals need to get crystal clear on what conditions we will tolerate, what we'll demand of our leaders, and decide what we're willing to summon within ourselves to change the situation. 
I had the opportunity to talk to Michelle Obama once while interning at the White House. She told us that when she became First Lady, she quickly realized that even the smartest people in the room at the highest levels with the fanciest credentials were winging it to some degree every time they started a new job or encountered a new situation. It was their willingness to step up, to be comfortable with uncertainty, and to learn and adapt quickly that set them apart from others. Those are skills we can all cultivate. So why not us? Our self-belief, or lack of it, sets the stage for democracy in the same way. If we know we deserve good lives, a decent standard of living, our leaders' attention to the issues we care about, if we reject avoidable suffering and the leaders who traffic in it, then getting to success, a country that works for everyone, is a dream that's within reach. Skip the personal work, believe we deserve whatever happens to us, and that we have no control, and we'll end up with more rage, more division, and certainly more tragedy. So ask yourself, what do you know? What matters to you? How do you express yourself best? And one more thing, what kind of world do you want to live in? Those answers will guide you to know your worth, then vote, and also know that your value does not depend on the outcome. By following these steps, we can cultivate the confidence in our worth that's in our control to shape. And that is one way to start to truly be the change we wish to see in the world. Thank you.